So what you tell you to skip your lead, to skip your like, way. We're talking about poetic meter in Virgil's Aeneid. In the last installment, we saw that Virgil's Aeneid is written in dactylic hexameter. That is a line of six feet hexameter in which the basic measure is a dactyl. A dactyl is a long followed by two short syllables. And um, in practice in dactylic hexameter, as you can tell by the graphic at the bottom of the screen here, two shorts can be replaced by one long to give us a spondy. Notice the first four feet, we can have a spondy instead of a dactyl for any one of those. And the last foot is always treated as a spondy, whether that last syllable is long or short. So the trick is determining which syllables are long and which are short. So there are three categories of syllables that are long. And once you figure out which syllables are long, then everything else is short. And the every syllable is based on one vowel sound. So we, we're going to be looking at the vowels and from that figuring out the syllables. So the first kind of um, long syllables, and this is the easiest, at least with the texts that we use, where they use macrons on, on, on these syllables, are the ones that are long by nature. These are sounds that just for that given word happen to be long. So we take a look at this line from the beginning of book two of the Aeneid, where um, Aeneas is telling Dido, Reviter Troyae Supremum Audire Laborum, and briefly, and briefly to hear the final struggle of Troy, is what he's saying to her. Um, these are the ones that are long by nature. Again, you can see from the text we're using, they're marked long. Now, in, not all texts use long marks, and certainly they didn't back in Virgil's day. But we can see there are certain endings, particularly, that are always going to be long. Those accusative plural endings, os, as, es. If a verb ends in, or a word of any sort ends in o, oh, that o is always going to be long. The genitive plural endings, orum and arum. And as we see, there are other endings that are normally long too. So, but long by nature. So those are all just always long. Now, as syllables in poetry, even if the vowel itself is short, these are other syllables that are going to be long. If you have a vowel followed by two consonants, and notice the two consonants don't even have to be in the same word. Look at, look at the first syllable here, et brevitir. The E is followed by actually three, three um, consonants, T, B, R. So that's going to be long. Or the E in brevitir at the end, right? E, R, followed by R, T. Again, they're not part of the same word, but followed by two consonants. Supremum. So we've got a number of those in this same line that we saw before. And a couple of details we need to bear in mind. X and Z are treated as double consonants because X is really like a KS sound. He was, or Z was considered to be uh, like a DS sound. So there's two consonant sounds in there. And this, again, the, the Romans got from the Greeks. Those are considered double consonants. Also, um, if the second consonant of two is an R or an L after certain other consonants. But basically, if it's an R or an L, sometimes we can we can treat that as short. We have a little bit of leeways. They're kind of like the uh, you know wild cards, if you want. The third thing are diphthongs, which are two vowel combinations that have only one vowel sound. The most common of these in Latin are A-E, pronounced I, and A-U, ow. Also O-E, oi. E, I, and E, U, those can also be diphthongs. So we see in this in the same line, we have this third category as well, Troy, I, I, one sound, two, two vowels, that's going to be long, and, or audire, 